It's the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable from IdeaStream Public Media. I'm Mike McIntyre. Thank you so much for joining us. Ohio Governor Mike DeWine stopped the car yesterday, turned to the legislatures in the back seat, and told them to knock it off and sit up straight. Really, that's a fair way to describe his rebuke over what he called the ridiculous and absurd situation where lawmakers could not agree on a simple administrative fix to allow President Joe Biden to appear on the November ballot in Ohio. The governor went further, though, seeking votes on a bill that would seek to limit the power of local judges to block state laws and another banning foreign contributions to state issue campaigns, both of which are much more contentious. A Franklin County judge's restraining order suspending HB 68, the law dealing with transgender health care and sports, was upheld by the House Supreme Court this week, but several justices were open to considering later the attorney general's claim that local judges shouldn't have such power over statewide issues. The House Senate passed a bill on that issue that the governor wants the House to consider next week. Summer normally brings a spike in crime, and Cleveland and Akron are looking to get ahead of the curve to keep neighborhoods safe. And Norfolk Southern has agreed to a modest $15 million civil fine, some call it modest, as part of a settlement with the U.S. Department of Justice over its toxic train derailment in East Palestine. Joining me for the roundtable from IdeaStream Public Media, reporters Matt Richman and Abigail Botar are here. Hello there. Good morning, morning, Mike. Good to see both of you. And in Columbus, State House News Bureau Chief Karen Kassler. Hey, Karen. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Has the governor ever stopped a car and told you to knock it off? <laughs> it, this was a really, really interesting moment. We were afraid it was just going to be a, uh, hey, let's do something, folks. But this got, uh, he, he was pretty direct on what he wanted to get done and how it was going to get done. Yeah, Thursday night before the Memorial Day holiday, I thought he might just say something like, let's drive safe and everyone have a great weekend. And he dropped some news on it. Let me just say, first of all, we don't take calls on the roundtable. We want to hear have your thoughts via email. So send them to soi at ideastream.org to talk talk about the uh, goings on at the state house or some of the local news we'll talk about you can also tweet at sound of ideas all right let's get ready to round table so governor as i mentioned he got this stern dad look yesterday he ordered lawmakers to come back pass this legislation now it became a, a, a partisan issue even Alabama, by the way, had passed a, a, an administrative fix because they had the same problem. What happens is there's 90 days before the election that you have to put the name on a ballot. The Democratic National Convention is not until less than 90 days, so he's not officially, uh, the president is not officially the candidate until that time. The easy fix is to change the date at least for once or maybe even permanently. And why could the legislature not get that done? Well, <laughs> certainly you could connect it to the continuing battle between House Speaker Jason Stevens and Senate President Matt Huffman, who are likely to face one another for the speakership coming up next year. That's the undercurrent of everything that's been happening here at the State House for a while. But you've got a, a set of bills here that have been going back and forth. And the most recent set of bills, the Senate had passed a couple of House bills where they had added in this ban on foreign contributions to ballot issue campaigns. They added that to a bill that would, it was actually a Democratic bill that would allow candidates to pay for child care through campaign funds. They added that ban on foreign contributions and they also added the ban or the, the extent, to, uh, the change of the deadline to make sure that Biden can get on the ballot. That was passed on May 8th. Democrats opposed that saying this is a way to change funding for ballot issue campaigns because Republicans keep losing those ballot issues. They lost their side lost last August on issue one. Their side lost last November on issue one. So that's been the undercurrent here is that th there are all these different things trying to come together because as both Stevens and Huffman, Speaker Jason Stevens, Senate President Matt Huffman have said, there's no will among Republicans alone to just pass a bill that would put Biden on the ballot, which is pretty interesting. So now the governor is saying just go ahead and get this done. Um, how, do, how do they just fall in line then? Well, that's a good question. We haven't had a special session in 20 years, and there was a bill that was specifically passed during that special session because Governor Bob Taft had called for that for campaign finance reform. That bill was passed. So it's assumed that there's going to be something that's going to happen in the special session on Tuesday, but we don't know what that is yet. Um, it could be D DeWine specifically wants both the change to put Biden on the ballot and the ban on foreign contributions and ballot campaigns. 
that ban on foreign contributions and ballot campaigns is important because there are two big ballot issues that may come up this fall. They haven't made the ballot yet. One on redistricting and one on raising the minimum wage. And so Republicans really want to put some rules on funding and fundraising and, and contributions for ballot issue campaigns before those issues come forward. So the, DeWine wants both of those. How that's going to happen is really the question. When you talk about the foreign money in campaign issues, there's already a, a ban on foreign money in individual uh, election races, right? For, for yes. people. State law does say that foreign nationals cannot contribute to campaign, to, to candidates rather. But there was a, an opinion from 2021 from the Ohio Elections Commission that said that that law that bans foreign nationals from contributing to candidates also bans foreign nationals from contributing to campaigns. And all this comes because there is a Swiss billionaire who is given to a progressive dark money group called the 1630 Fund. And that group was one of many that donated last year around the abortion related issue that came up in November. There are conservative groups, dark money groups that donated as well. But this this uh, Swiss billionaire has gotten a lot of attention among Republicans across the country because of his donations to this progressive group. Right. When you say around the abortion issue, it was in support of the amendment enshrining abortion rights. Yes, on uh, for the 1630 Fund and some of these other groups uh, that were specifically donating to try to get issue one passed and get that abortion access amendment approved. And then there were some conservative groups that were advocating against issue one in November. Of course, there was an issue one in August, but that was the reverse there. <laughs> There's another issue that the governor says needs to be dealt with next week, and that's a bill that already passed along party lines in the Senate could make it harder for common pleas court judges to block state laws. The Supreme Court this week allowed a Franklin County judge's temporary restraining order of House Bill 68 to stand. That blocks the bill that bans gender-affirming health care for trans youth and prohibits trans athletes from competing in women's sports. It will be blocked until the resolution of a lawsuit challenging its constitutionality. But in blocking it, several Republican justices, led by Pat DeWine, the governor's son, indicated the question about local judicial power should be decided later on. And the Ohio Attorney General has claimed that restraining orders should apply only to defendants in the case, not to everyone. This has really set off a firestorm within the court. Yeah, and and that's why I said that we don't know exactly what bill the legislature is going to take up, because of the several bills that are out there that would ban foreign contributions to ballot issue campaigns, that one, the one you just referenced that passed this week, does include this provision that would make it easier for the state to appeal when local judges block state laws. And, And that's a real question that came up in the order that said basically House Bill 68, the uh, the bill that would ban tran- gender transition treatments for minors and trans athletes and girls sports, that can't go into effect until after the trial. And and the judges were, unan- the justices were unanimous on that, saying that this is not an emergency. We're not going to lift that order and let that law go into effect. But the question of whether a local judge can put an order on a state law that does stop that law from going into effect, the court has signaled that they they would be interested in hearing that case. And Stevens and Huffman both have suggested that they think that there's a problem with that. But when you look at the uh, opinions there, Democratic Justice Jennifer Bruner said, hey, wait a minute, that's if, if a judge if a judge determines a law is likely unconstitutional, it shouldn't be put into place on anyone. It shouldn't be just not put into place locally, but it shouldn't be put into place on anyone. So that's a real question I think will likely come up. What's interesting is that what they're talking about are common pleas court judges. And so they keep referring to them as local judges, like their rulings only deal with a yeah. certain small geographic area. They are a state court. Yeah. And, and what this really means is for a lot of legislation, House Bill 68, abortion legislation, this is the path that it goes through. It gets passed by Republicans in the legislature and there are groups that oppose it. Once it's signed, they take it to court and they get a judge to put an order to stop the law from going into effect until the trial can happen and until the case can be litigated. And so if you take that away or you make it easier for the state to appeal, you 
potentially put some of these laws into place more quickly, or at least you move the legal process forward more quickly. That's really important because the legislature said they're not going to pass any laws that change abortion policy in Ohio. So all abortion related laws are going to go through this process. So that that really suggests an impact that goes in a, in a totally different direction. So rather than being in response to HB 68, many are seeing this as a preemptive measure because of what's coming down the pike regarding abortion rights. Absolutely. I mean, I think everything that you have to look at here with the ban on foreign contributions and ballot issues, with with this proposal to make it easier for the state to appeal when local judges block state laws, all of this is looking down the road at what might happen going forward because voters approved this abortion access amendment. And there are other ballot issues that are ahead on redistricting that would change the way those district lines are drawn, that would raise the minimum wage. All of this stuff is coming together. And and the legislature has been unable to move a lot of legislation because of this battle between Stevens and Huffman. So this is all coming up uh, to a boil right now. Here's another issue involving the power of a common police court judge over state law. Another Franklin County judge, not the one we talked about earlier, this week ruled unconstitutional the state law that would prohibit cities from regulating tobacco products. So Cleveland looked for an effort there to ban, ban flavored tobacco products is already a ban in Columbus. Columbus. The judge in the case determined the state law violated home rule powers. Yeah, and I, I think that's been a discussion that's been going on for a very long time about what do communities have the power to do versus what does the state tell them they have the power to do. And so this will continue on. Um, you know, this is a, a, another piece of legislation that's been heavily discussed. I mean, DeWine vetoed it once when it was a standalone bill. He vetoed it in the budget. Lawmakers came back and overrode that veto. Republicans did, saying it's unfair to businesses. And so now it's in court. You've got 14 cities that now can continue their ban on flavored tobacco and vapes because of what this judge said. And this case continues. In Cleveland's case, no ban yet, but continue its effort to put forth a ban. Council hasn't yet voted on it. It's a permanent injunction. um, And people are saying appeal of that is unlikely. Uh, I, I, an appeal is likely. Oh, I is think. likely. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, because I think right, this right. is another case that's going to go to the Ohio Supreme Court that's going to have to decide. And the, the Supreme Court has gotten into home rule in so many different areas. I mean, traffic cameras, uh, residency requirements, guns, all of these things that the Supreme Court has tried to referee on who has home rule power versus whether the legislature has its power. So I expect this to go all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court. We had the health director for the city of Cleveland in here yesterday, David Margolius, talking about the efforts to curb flavored tobacco and the idea that smoking rates are hugely high in Cleveland and the death rate from that is incredibly high as well. They're looking for every effort to thwart smoking. This would be one of them. Yeah, and that's what DeWine has said, that this is about public health. It's about especially stopping younger people from smoking and, and helping people get away from that habit. But Republicans have said this is about business concerns, that uh, a city can ban flavored vapes, and then you can just go across the street if you're on a city boundary and buy it over there, and that's not fair. DeWine has said, okay, well, let's have a statewide ban. Well, there's no appetite to have a statewide ban. He suggested that in the State of the State speech and basically got no response on that one. Yeah, just like uh, recreational marijuana now, you could just go over to Michigan and get it. But local communities can ban recreational marijuana. That's an interesting point. Interesting. All right, let's move on to uh, another issue that Cleveland and Akron are dealing with, and that is summer safety. They promise in Cleveland an all-of-government approach. The arrival typically brings a spike, the arrival of summer typically brings a spike in violent crime. Last May, the city encountered a dramatic increase in homicides. Matt, the crime numbers have been low, which has been good. They've been low compared to comparisons to last year in history, et cetera. But summer always brings a wave. Yeah, that's uh, um, to be expected. There, the the idea is to continue something that uh, that Mayor Bibb started last year called the Rise Initiative. And I mean, that was started in August la- last year, which is raising investment in safety for everyone. I was going to do that. <laughs> I got I promise. you. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's that's phrases for, for police. That's an increased use of uh, uh, task forces like federal local partnerships. That's uh, uh, traffic and warrant sort of sweeps and crackdowns. Um, and then there are there are the changes to the policy with the with the police department where they're 
the uh, the patrols on 12 hour shifts now and that makes it easier to keep those those shifts fully staffed every day what is hot spot policing um, that is you know basically you take crime crime data decide kind of figure out where most crime occurs and then focus your resources in those places and so you know that would mean um, and it's not it's not a new thing you know there are certain neighborhoods when when there's increase in violent crime and they have these crackdowns you know you'll see uh, highway patrol uh, cars on corners kind of watching for traffic violations and pull people over and checking for warrants and it's sort of you know a flooding of the zone to um, to kind of try to tamp down crime and uh, one of the things that interim public safety director Wayne Drummond said that I thought was interesting you know was that he's not going to say where these hotspots are where this in- increase in, in enforcement's going to occur but in his 35 years in, Cle- in the Cleveland Police Department, it's pretty much always the same areas. Mm-hmm. So, and they're looking at um, camera, you know, uh, security cameras. They're looking at Shot Spotter, which is the sound system that would detect mm-hmm. that there is gunfire. Although you've done a lot of reporting on that, whether there's a lot of efficacy to it, but they put all that together to determine where these hotspots are. As you said, people basically know what they are. Is there anyone that has a problem with the constitutionality of going into a neighborhood and saying we're we're going to do a blitz of enforcement? So basically, anyone in that neighborhood is a suspect. Yes. Um, I mean, there there are questions about, um, you know, the uh, if if like like, uh, you know, interim safety director Drummond said, if it's always the same neighborhoods, what what kind of a um, why are these neighborhoods kind of getting this increased, even if it's just traffic enforcement like um, that is a, a burden to place on people. And then, you know, there, there's a question of like how how really effective is it if you go in and do this, you. Um, you're quieting things down. A lot of people are kind of laying low because there are police everywhere for two weeks, three three weeks. Um, but that doesn't really solve the, uh, the the problem. And like Drummond said, it, it keeps coming back and we keep going back and doing these things, but it doesn't really address the underlying issues. One of the things that, that Mayor Bibb said that this summer is going to include when he says the all of government approach is that in these hotspot areas particularly, they're going to send in building and housing for for code violation checks. They're going to go in um, and fix light bulb sidewalks, do public works um, repairs. Uh, you know, so um, it won't just be police attention on these parts of the city, and not just government either. There are violence interrupters. City council voted for three hundred thousand dollars, one hundred thousand each, to three groups that will deploy street violence interrupters in these hotspots. And Akron uh, Abigail is working on a pilot program for a street team to curb gun violence too. City council still has to approve the program, but the outline of the plan was unveiled in a special city council caucus this week. I think it was in a local restaurant. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea here is to have people experienced in gun violence be the ones that help curb it. Right. It seems similar to what what Cleveland's idea is here, and this is something that Mayor Shamas Malik unveiled in his State of the City speech. And the plan here is that the city will hire and train what they call these credible messengers who are able to speak directly to those involved in gun violence, especially young people. Um, And that's because these credible messengers have themselves had a history with the criminal justice system. So they'll be able to more relate and and get through to people likely to be um, committing crime or involved in violence in the city. Um, And Malik has said that these programs have been very effective across the country. It's time to bring it to Akron. And and so the city, if passed by city council, the plan would be to contract with a nonprofit that already provides mental health support and then they can hire and train the credible messengers and get them out on the streets. Like Cleveland, they'll find the hot spots. That's where they're going to work. But mm-hmm. uh, importantly, these folks are not in conjunction with police. Right. And so they'll, the police will be providing the data on the hot spots, but the, the city has said that the credible messengers won't even be in contact with the police to get that data. It'll go through a different agency to get that information on on the crime hot spots. And they, and, and they said the plan would be to start the pilot in one or two neighborhoods that have have significant crime but aren't like the biggest hotspots in the city to kind of see how it works before expanding to maybe some of those um, higher higher areas of crime. It will be really interesting, and I know you are always pulling records and looking at stats, Matt. The idea that we are down in crime generally across the country in, in Cleveland and whether that holds for the summer or we end up, you know, this sort of becomes a, 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 a point where where it turns the other way. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there's a lot that has 
changed in the last couple of years. You know, there's a, there's a new chief of police, obviously a new mayor in the last couple of years, a new public safety director. There's um, sort of been a shift in, you know, um, and nobody knows how much this played a role in the spike in crime, but there have been a lot of things done to, to address low police morale. And so it'll be interesting to see if all these things together change things this this summer i'd say we're all hoping that they do all right let's take a quick break right now we come back both cleveland and akron public school districts are facing budget shortfalls making plans to ask voters to approve levies we're going to deal with that right after the break this is the sound of ideas reporters roundtable i'm mike mcintyre stay tuned Welcome back to the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Mike McIntyre with Abigail Botar and Matt Richmond, as well as Karen Kassler. Before we get back to the roundtable, a reminder to check out this week's Ideastream News Quiz. You can find that at ideastream.org slash quiz, which I just went to. And I can tell you the first question, Matt Richmond just gave you the answer. So I'll, I'll actually ask it. So this one's an easy one. Cleveland Mayor Justin Bibb is promising uh, what approach to crime prevention this summer? Is it a, don't answer it, Matt. He was like, oh, oh, all right, Horshack, settle down over there. Um, Only I understood that reference and maybe some of the listeners. Uh, A restorative approach, a data-driven approach, a targeted approach, or an all-of-government approach. You might have heard Matt say that just a minute ago. Now you have one answer in your quiver. Go to ideastream.org slash quiz and get the rest of the questions and answers. Listen to the rest of the show. You'll probably get all the answers. All right, moving on. The Akron Board of Education signed off this week on the elimination of 285 positions, including 52 teachers. Akron is facing a budget deficit looking to right size due to a decline in enrollment. And Abigail, the decision to cut those positions came as teachers protested against the budget reduction plan. They mobilized. Yeah, immediately, right before the school board met, teachers were outside of the, of the headquarters in downtown Akron protesting the proposed cut. Uh, There's some pretty strong allegations here. The union is even saying that the district and the superintendent are union busting, and uh, and they're alleging that the superintendent has disciplined teachers who are critical of his administration. So tensions are, are certainly high right now between the union and the district. By the way, Abigail just answered question two on the quiz, so just so you know. <laughs> and, and I would say that that... The other question, uh, it's debatable about whether there are two right answers. If you ask Mayor Bibb, there could be a second right answer. All right, let's not get anything clouded in this thing. Uh, It's it's, it's the quote you gave, all right? (laughs) Very good. Um, So these cuts are not the only way the district is dealing with budget shortfalls in Akron. Um, uh, Abigail, voters are going to be asked to approve a new levy that hasn't yet been put on yet, but they'll be asked to do that. Right. That's something that that the school board is discussing. The district says it needs increased funding to keep operations going, even with these cuts. Um, And so next week, we'll see if the board will vote to put this levy and what the exact details will be in terms of of cost um, that that the voters will be asked to weigh in on in November. So that'll be next week. And I know Connor Morris will be all over that. Certainly Um, will, our education reporter. And we'll be talking about this in just a second. Matt, I'll ask you to weigh in, too. Cleveland is going to be asking for money from voters, and it also faces many of these same situations. It's a big difference, though. In Cleveland, there was a new union contract. There is a p- labor piece there. In this case, you not only had teachers protesting outside the school board meeting, but teachers have made allegations that the new superintendent there and the district are looking to bust the union. And uh, I wonder how he's responded, the superintendent, to that criticism. Yeah, he didn't really. He, he responded through the spokesperson for the district who said that the district hasn't heard of these allegations, that the union hasn't brought them to the district, which the spokesperson said would be the appropriate way to address concerns. So we haven't really gotten an answer on if those are credible allegations. Um, the, the union also had issues with uh, some comments that the superintendent Michael Robinson made at a church, which was uh, right before the board meeting. He was at a church um, mainly talking about the financial health of the district and the plan for cuts. Um, but union members specifically had issues with the his use of the word devil, which he used to describe bad forces that were going to come out for this board meeting this week. Um, and the union took that to mean that he was referring to them, although Robinson never directly referenced the union and and he later denied he was talking about the union and said he was talking generally about challenges facing the district as a whole is it, it was a weird it's a weird speech but certainly amped up um you know that contentiousness between the superintendent and the the teachers union in a, in a time where things are already really 
tensions are already really high. That's a common thing in Akron. I remember Christine Fowler Mack and her um, being in uh, having contentious relationships with the board and et cetera. Now a new superintendent, the same thing. Um, it seems like that's an Akron thing. It's it's a it's a tough look, I think, for for the because a lot of people in the community think that the board kind of ruined a, ch- a chance with Fowler Mack that she was really well liked in the community, um, and so now to turn around and have. Um, you know, teacher cuts, which are not going to be popular, uh, levy, which, you know, is a hard ask for people in, in today's financial times. So it's it's a I don't, it's a bad look for APS. I'll actually be going to a meeting later today of talking about um, how what the community view of the schools is. So well, more to come on that. But love to hear about that. Yeah, it's very, very interesting right now. In Cleveland, as I uh, signaled, Matt, uh, the school district will ask voters in November to approve a combined levy and bond issue. It's facing looming, bu- looming budget deficit, already made millions of dollars in cuts. The combined issue is 8.6 mils for operating costs and this levy as well, if you split the two of them apart. That's a lot. Uh, it's a lot to ask. It's not like a, a, a mil increase or two mil. Um, and mil is not million, by the way. It's a <laughs> unit of measurement to determine how much you'll pay uh, uh, in your in your property tax bill. But it's a big ask. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to compare it to to Akron. The new superintendent here in here in Cleveland did not do cuts that were nearly as you know there were not several hundred uh, layoffs mm-hmm. before going for this uh, levy, and and he maybe wanted to skip the fights that are occurring in 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 Akron, um, and you know it'll be interesting to see how this how this campaign goes the. The previous superintendent was a very popular, very popular with with council, um, and so it'll be interesting to see the the mayor and the new superintendent going out and how much support they get from from council. In addition to this uh, operating levy, there's the separate bond issue. That's 2.65 mil for a bond issue. That's to renovate and construct district buildings, pay for capital expenses. So to know how t- taxes work, the operating levy will pay for you know, salaries and all that kind of stuff to administer a school district. Capital stuff comes from a bond issue. That's where you build stuff. Yeah, and that, yeah, and that basically means that the money comes in at once and then you pay it off over time when you, when you sell the bonds. Um, and they're combining them together, so it's one vote. And um, that seems to be at least in part to make it more likely that the capital bond, because it's, you know, it's easier to sell an operating levy where you say, if we don't do this, we're going to lay off teachers, kids are going to suffer. Um, whereas it could be a little harder to say, well, we need some new carpet. Uh, we got a roof problem at the, at the administration building. Yeah, the boring stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's easier to vote no on those and say, you'll just, just live with that. Um, so they combined it, and you've got to vote once. Yeah, anybody who's had to um, pit, foot the bill on putting in a new furnace at their house realizes <laughs> that's the stuff you never want to have to pay for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not, it's not, it doesn't make the house look any better. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on to uh, another state issue. The Ohio Senate unanimously passed a bill on Wednesday that would make it easier for drivers to restore their suspended licenses. It'll also scale back the number of reasons a driver's license can be suspended. Ohio now lists 30 reasons a license can be suspended, and many of them don't have anything to do with uh, safety on the roads. Matt, criminal justice reform Reform advocates point to license suspension is unfair because they impact people who are poor more. They generally impact people who are minorities more. Yeah, this is um, uh, one of those really big ongoing issues that like anytime if you ever go to municipal court um, and talk to just about anybody there, it's one person after another trying to deal with a suspended license and trying to um, pay off tickets. And once you get a, a suspended life license, you still got to drive to work. You still got to take your kids around. You still have to live your life. And then you get pulled over again and, and you're driving on a suspended license. Then you get a, another year tacked on. It's a spiral. So it is just so hard to get out of. Karen, it's interesting. It's a, very, it's a bipartisan bill and it was a unanimous passage. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, in this environment, that's kind of a big deal. But uh, what you said in the beginning about how there's like some 30 reasons that your driver's license could be suspended. It's all sorts of things like not having insurance on a car you don't regularly drive, causing significant property damage, alcohol and drug offenses, failure to pay a court debt. Uh, These are some of the things that lawmakers were looking at as reasons to suspend that suspension and make it easier for people to get their driver's licenses back and, and reinstated and, and not have to deal with all that that spiral that Matt just talked about. It's interesting. The Ohio Poverty Law Center 
estimated a million drivers had suspended licenses from 2016 to 2020. That's where our, our data set comes from. It's one out of every li- uh, eight licensed drivers across the state. And 60% of the suspensions stem from, as you mentioned, debt-related or other issues not related to dangerous driving. I mean, you, you would think suspend because you're not, you can hurt people on the road, but you're being suspended because you can't pay your court bill. Right. And, and it's one of those things that, you know, I think the goal is to try to make sure that people do pay these debts, but it does create m- matched use of the word spiral is exactly the right one. And, and especially among people who have lesser means. One of the things I saw when I was reading was a, a retroactive um, uh, effort, too, because there have been times when th- there was sort of a fishing for who doesn't have a uh, an insurance uh, card. It wasn't just being stopped and asked. But there are a lot of ways that people are being jammed up. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you renew your driver's license and that sort of thing, they ask you if you have insurance, but they don't require you to show an insurance card. And and so, you know, this is one of the little areas of the law that's kind of interesting. But we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who were caught in this. I mean, 250,000 people, last number I saw, that uh, have their driver's license suspension, driver's license suspended each year in Ohio. And that's, that's a tremendous number of people. And when you talk about all the money that's involved in getting those suspensions overturned and those licenses reinstated, this is, this it's big. All right. And, and I was going to throw it, you know, um, but we were talking about hotspot policing before, and so much of that is is increased traffic enforcement and warrant sweeps, which is in some cases just checkpoints where driver pulls up, you check their ID to see if they have warrants. And in those sorts of situations, that's how you create a lot of the circumstances for people to either, you know, be caught with driving on a suspended license or to get a new, you know, traffic ticket case that then eventually leads to a suspended license. So like you were saying, it it affects poor neighborhoods more. Karen, the Ohio House also took up vehicular safety, passed unanimous bill uh, that raises the penalties for deadly drunk driving incidents. Yeah, it passed unanimously. Again, quite a feat. And there was even a standing ovation for the parents of a woman who was killed by a drunk driver in 2020. And that's kind of unusual for the legislature to do. And uh, this would increase minimum financial penalties for drunk driving by $375, increase the minimum mandatory prison sentence for aggravated vehicular homicide that involves a DUI or an OVI when there's a prior offense here. So this was an attempt to try to make the law a little bit tougher to continue to crack down on drunk driving. Karen, a DUI? Um, I, I'm sorry. Driving DUI, under the influence. driving under the influence. OVI is operating a vehicle under the influence. Okay. Excellent. There you Thank go. Thank you. Good. All right. Let's, uh, let's get one other story in before our break, and that is in East Palestine. Norfolk Southern will pay $310 million to settle a lawsuit filed by the U.S. Department of Justice in the East Palestine Toxic Train Derailment. It includes a $15 million civil penalty. I said at the beginning of the show that they were paying $15 million. That's just the civil penalty. $310 million is the total. The train derailed in February 23 in the Columbiana County Village, leading to evacuations, concerns over lingering health aspects or health impacts. And Abigail, you've been on this story since the very beginning, continuing to do follow-ups. The railroad has also agreed to pay for long-term monitoring and mental health support for residents. Right. And that's why I think the whole number is more indicative of the total burden that's going to be on Norfolk Southern, because it's not just the 15 million civil pen- penalty. They've also agreed to, to do some of these long-term monitoring um asks that the community has been pushing for like the like the health monitoring the mental health services um funding for long-term environmental monitoring protecting nearby waterways and drinking water resources but there's also like a big undertaking in in this agreement that Norfolk Southern will be taking measures to improve rail safety. I think they've said that they're going to be spending two, some $200 million to improve um, the safety of their trains to stop accidents like this happening in the future. The federal government's also um, ensuring that Norfolk Southern will improve coordination with government officials during emergency responses. And, and you know, of course, the, the the whole overarching thing is footing the bill for the entire cleanup here. So it's much more than just a fine. It's much more than just paying for some of these long term. This this has ramifications for um, hopefully making sure that an accident like this never happens again with, with this railroad. So we're near a billion if we add in the $600 million class action settlement in a case brought by residents and businesses. But there's still some concern by some of the residents about how much you're individually going to see. Right. Yeah. And that doesn't even include how much Norfolk says that they spent like 
um, in the aftermath of the accident reimbursing people. Um, that kind of fits in with this $600 million class action settlement. But what the what the class action settlement doesn't include is potential long-term health problems. So people can't get payouts for maybe getting cancer in 20 years, which is, I think is going to be a big sticking point. We've heard from residents who said they're concerned about how big their piece of this money will be, depending on how many people ultimately decide to sign up, sign on for this class action. Um, but the fact that there's not going to be any compensation for long-term health is something that residents have said is concerning, as some say they still have symptoms from the derailment. Um, the way that it'll work is um, that the the money that, that residents will get will depend on how close they live to the derailment site and how it affected them. So we'll still see how much, how much people will be getting from this allotment of cash um, as the weeks come. Lawyers have to sort through that and go back to East Palestine and kind of pitch it to people as why this is this is a good settlement and why we should we should take the deal. So much more to come on that. It sounds like a blockbuster movie still in development. <laughs> Definitely very dramatic at times, yes. All right. We're going to take another quick break right now. We still have a few stories to go, including the city of Cleveland looking to crack down on short-term vacation rentals, such as those through Airbnb and Verbo. This is the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable. I'm Mike McIntyre. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable. I'm Mike McIntyre, along with Abigail Botar, Matt Richmond, and Karen Kassler. Cleveland City Council is attempting to rein in short-term vacation rentals. Short-term rentals often found through sites such as Airbnb and Verbo. They've grown in popularity over the years, and the city is proposing a licensing system for short-term rentals that would require a local contact person if there are complaints about the property. Matt, it's not the first time council has wrangled with short-term rentals and how to deal with the growth of them. Uh, yeah, this, this started back during um, <clears throat> started back during the the Republican National Convention in 2016, um, but there wasn't sort of the uh, teeth that I think the council members are are, are looking for, um, and now they they would all, you know, it'll it would I think the earliest it would take effect in the fall, and they would have to be registered, and there would be fines for if there are problems, there'd be a yearly fee, um, there'd be rules about. Um, uh, you know how many prop? Well, no, sorry, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, there, but there's there a rule. Be, yes, there's a there's a, a limit to the number of short-term rental properties there could be in the neighborhood. Thank you. Yes, Indeed. that was the rule. I forgot the details about that. Um, and you know, and then yeah, the the council members would want to have somebody who could be held responsible for problems at the property. So what's the problem? I mean, what's the idea is, you know, it's seen, I see the commercials. It's like, hey, we're all going to go as a nice, happy family and enjoy a place. But what's happening in some of these neighborhoods that's bothering council members like Kerry McCormack is what? Well, I think that there are cases where places will be rented just sort of as like a party house. <laughs> um, it's not families going to, you know, have a have a kitchen instead of being stuck in a hotel room. It's people renting a house, kind of filling it up for a weekend or longer. Um, and just partying and, and bothering the uh, neighbors who are kind of trying to live their normal lives. Yeah, that would kind of that would kind of suck. If yeah. you're sitting there and somebody next door every weekend is another party. Yeah. Um, it's not like you can establish a relationship with the neighbor and say, hey, the, the kid needs to get to sleep. Every weekend it's another group of people having a great time, but it doesn't do a whole yeah. lot for you. Yeah, and, and you don't neighbor. know who they are, where they came from. So, yeah. Interesting. Well, we will um, we'll certainly uh, continue to follow that. That was a story, by the way, by our friend Michelle Jarbo at Channel 5, where she was looking into that. And, of course, uh, we'll continue to follow it. Um, on the uh, question about the um, Akron Public Schools budget, and it goes really to you, Karen, from Nancy. She says, when is Ohio going to remedy the unconstitutional funding of the schools, which had already been determined by the courts a number of times? Well, the argument has been that it was fixed with the fair school p- funding plan that was passed in the budget uh, this t- the budget to four years ago. So uh, that's still an issue, I think, that has been debated. But the Ohio Supreme Court told the legislature to figure it out, and that's what the legislature said they did. Okay, so there you go, Nancy, all fixed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the fair school funding plan, I should note, you know, it tries to take a little bit of property tax value as well as household wealth and tries to maybe bring a little bit of balance there. Uh, but it's it's complicated and it's a lot of money and it's I, I have no time to explain it all here. <laughs> OK, good. Uh, and we had another thought since we're talking about uh, reader feedback or listener feedback. Uh, Pat. Uh, from East Cleveland sends a note about violence interrupters and making uh, the place of the 
city is safer uh, over the summer, says focus on the group that commits the most crime and the prevention that is the most effective. Keep the kids busy. Have a lot of activities everywhere every day. It's proven to decrease drug problems. And then she says the old uh, line, just do it. All right, moving along. Metro Health is seeking an additional $25 million to continue providing medical services at the Cuyahoga County Jail. The hospital system began providing health care services at the jail in 2019 after a number of people being held there died. A report by the U.S. Marshals Service attributed the deaths in part to a lack of medical attention. And this was before Metro Health had come in. They came in after that U.S. Marshals Service report and said, we're going to provide health care there. Now, Matt, they're talking about wanting a large chunk of money to expand. Uh, how the council reacted well so this would be it was a, a initially a three-year contract through through 2022 there was a two-year extension uh um that or a, or a three-year extension that would have ended uh beginning of, of of may this year so two-year extension that would end at the beginning of yeah. may this year uh council and metro health want to carry that through the end of uh, january and the amount that 25 million dollars you know, the last extension for two years, they asked for $30 million. So, so this is now less for, than a year. For now, for nine months, they want almost as much. And so council basically says, well, we have no uh, no real oversight of this. So we don't really understand what you what is leading to these charges. Like, And, and they focused in on when Metro Health takes people out of the jail and brings them to a Metro Health or UH or some other hospital facility for, for treatment. Metro Health doesn't turn over to the county, you know, this run to the hospital was for a broken arm, this was for this or that. It's just, um, you know, a run and they went to see a an x-ray specialist or, you know. So council's basically saying we would like in the next contract to understand better where exactly this, this money's going. And that, at this point is about all they can do because they – they need somebody for the next nine months to be in the jail. Right. So they're going to pay more money, but they want to have more say. They want to know where the money's going. They in want the, the data, all yep. of that kind of stuff. Yep. Maybe it'll inform the next contract. That is that is the hope, is that when they negotiate another contract, this will be included in it. All right. Going to Akron, it named uh, the city named Brian Harding, the new police chief this week. He's been the acting chief since Steve Milet retired from the job. He'll be sworn in next week. The decision seemed to be a foregone conclusion, Abigail, since the city decided to keep the search to internal candidates only, citing a, a city regulation, a law that, that they hope to have changed uh, by voters. But um, Brian Harding is the is the new chief. Yeah, it's not really a surprise. He, he was named the finalist. Um, maybe last month so we've we've kind of known that this is where it was leading but it was a it was a contentious search because of of this rule that that mayor shamas malik says stops him from hiring externally so the due to rules about rank in the city charter the mayor was only looking at harding and deputy chief jesse leaser who are both white um and they ultimately went with with Harding, but that drew criticism from from people in the community, including a group of black elected officials who penned a letter to the mayor asking him to pause this search until he can hire an external candidate. And the mayor said that that was kind of counterintuitive to what he wants to do with the policing, that having an interim chief for that long wouldn't ultimately be good for the city. And so he he pressed on with this search and, and says that Harding is the right man for the job. But he, he was really frustrated with this. So, you know, he's proposed some ideas on how to diversify the police department. And he's moving forward with putting a charter amendment on the ballot in November to allow him to hire external candidates in the future, both for the police department and the fire department. There was one other deputy that was a candidate for this. Now the mayor is talking about a huge payout yeah. to let him to leave from to make have him leave. It's like something like four hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Has there been some question about that amount of money and why it needs to happen, et cetera? Certainly, yeah. So it is four hundred thousand dollars to get Deputy Chief Leaser to to leave the department. Um, so this was proposed in council this week, and council members certainly had questions about if, if that's a dangerous precedent to set. Why is it that much money? That's that's a huge amount of money. Um, Malik's administration says um, that's uh, kind of par for the course in terms of Leaser giving up his pension for not filling, you know, not retiring age, that that would be the appropriate amount to pay him. And, and the reason that Malik's administration proposed this is is so that he can say that other 
he says that the reason is for other officers to be promoted up into the system. I mean, the problem is that, you know, however many years ago when we weren't hiring officers of color or female officers, they can't make their way up into the ranks because they weren't hired 20 years ago. And so now we see more diverse candidates in the police um getting trained to be police officers in Akron, but it's going to take 20 years for them to get to police chief level. So it doesn't really fix the problem that we have right now. So this is Malik, one of Malik's ways that he says that he will be able to diversify the department. He says if Lisa takes the buyout, if, if council passes the buyout and Lisa takes it, that he and the police chief plan to promote three other officers to deputy chiefs and that he plans to introduce buyout plans for lieutenants and captains as well to make space for more diverse candidates. All right. Keep an eye on that story for mm-hmm. sure. A thought from Craig in Cleveland. He says, I applaud the Cleveland City Council for regulating short-term rentals. I hope that properties with tax abatements would be prohibited from being a short-term rental or the tax abatement is revoked. Uh, There's a thought. I hope Kerry McCormack is listening. He'll probably add that to the legislation. Moving on, Cuyahoga County plans to launch two new programs to make the region more climate-friendly. County Executive Chris Ronayne announced the plans during this week's Climate Leadership Conference. Abigail, one is Solars for Schools. Solar for Schools. It aims to help districts lower energy costs. Mm by employing solar energy. Right. So the program will give five districts the ability to tap into grant funding to install solar panels. And I think the really interesting thing is that these are going to um, high schools in Cuyahoga County that have been identified as energy justice communities, which the county says that means that these these high schools have historically been overlooked for climate and energy investments. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're going to Maple Heights, Euclid, Cuyahoga Heights, and East Cleveland, and they'll announce one more school that that this um, this initiative will be going to. And he also gave some details about the Freshwater Institute we've heard him mention in the past. Right. So uh, the kind of idea, I hadn't heard of this actually until um, this week, but the idea behind this is that this institute will foster stewardship around Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga River and kind of build up the next generation of water conservationists um, to kind of better manage the great natural resources we have here. And so some of the details we've learned um, from Ronane this week is that it will be centered in Cuyahoga County. They're expecting to name a director and begin work as early as this fall. And although it it will be here in in Cuyahoga County, they're welcoming collaborations from all eight counties bordering Lake Erie, which I didn't realize. I feel like I didn't realize there were only eight counties bordering Lake Erie. Lake Erie. Yeah. And so that's a that's a fun number to learn. They were basically all in one congressional district at some point. Yeah. <laughs> the snake on the lake. Um, anyway, so more to come on that, certainly. But we, we got, you know, hopefully that will be launching this fall. Great. Hey, Karen, do you uh, did you listen to the graduation speech, the commencement speech we put together this year from the crowd? The crowd Always do. Speech? Yeah, it's Always great, do. great stuff. Yeah. Everyone, every, everyone gave us one line. And it's, you know, a lot of people think it's just for college, but it's also for high school graduates. And my favorite, by the way, was the last line, don't be a dum-dum, um, <laughs> which is pretty easy. Uh, and I understand that you've, um, you've got a graduate uh, in your ranks, not a college graduate yet, but uh, I would think four years away from that or three. Yeah, I, I just wanted to give a shout out to the class of 2024. I can't believe it's here already, but my son is included in that. Uh, he will be graduating tomorrow from Westerville South High School. Go Cats. And uh, I'm just really proud of him. And we should be proud of all of those who have furthered their education by graduating high school, graduating college, moving on to whatever extra curricular education they've gotten. And I think it's just great. Yeah. And I would say sit him down in a chair, play that crowdsource commencement speech. There's a lot of great uh, advice in there. And you can find it, by the way, going to by going to ideastream.org. And, um, or you can just search, search in Google, which I do, which is uh, crowd, Crowdsource Commencement Speech 2024 and Ideastream. You'll find it. Anyway, uh, that and all the wisdom you just delivered to them on a daily basis, Karen. <laughs> okay, sure. All right. <laughs> we want to keep those graduates, uh, college graduates particularly in Ohio, but they're also going to be part of a big crowd because Ohio flexed its tourism might in 2023. A lot of people came and visited. Hopefully some of them will come and stay. According to the Ohio Department of Development, 238 million visitors came to Ohio last year. It's a new record. The combined spending from tourists is pretty impressive. The state says it's not just the big attractions bringing people in. So, Matt, what are they all coming to see? That's a very good question. I was just <laughs> thinking about that. And how what do they, they even doing? count that? But, um, you know, I, I think it's my... As an as a not as a Cleveland transplant, um, who's lured quite a few people into visiting Cleveland, I think that the uh, the 
the unofficial uh, tourism slogan of Cleveland should be Cleveland. I was pleasantly surprised. <laughs> so I think this is further. You bring proof them to the West Side Market. Yes. You, you go down you to the them, Metro that, Parks. That, bit, that episode of Thirty Rock where <laughs> that's basically the entire thing. Cleveland, why not? It's fine. I also feel like Taylor Swift came to Ohio last year, right? Yeah. So, so Cincinnati so probably got a big boom. A bunch of people followed along. From that huh? Taylor Swift anomics. And a lot of the people who came said that a good number of them said they'd come back again, which is good. Eighty-four percent said they're likely to visit Ohio again in the next twelve. Months, so that's, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the, the slogan shouldn't be "Ohio, a nice place to visit," but I wouldn't. No, we wouldn't say that last part. I wouldn't want to live there. No. <laughs> Sometimes you hear that as a joke. No, I love living here too. We want you to visit, and we love living here.